Echochi, here we are. We're live. <laughs> Hi, Georgia. This is great. Ciao, Mary. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How Switzerland and your transplanted life? Yeah, as you can see, I have a ton of furniture. Uh, speaking of renting, yeah, I have no couch, and it doesn't arrive until September because of the COVID situation. So, just sitting a lot. What about you? Uh, I know that life well, waiting around for furniture to arrive. Um, I'm doing well. <laughs> Want to warn the audience um, here that uh, my little pup might jump up into the screen at any point, um, but that'll just add to the <laughs> to the liveliness and the real life spirit of Rental Diaries, the column and the book. So yeah, Four yeah. Walls in Florence is the subtitle of the book, Thoughts from My Four Walls in Florence. and. That's pretty much what we've got going on here in terms of space, so. <laughs> yeah, well, honestly, I would be, as I said before, I would be very disappointed if Miro didn't, Miro the hero didn't uh, make an appearance, so. <laughs> it, only, it only goes to the theme. And also, um, for everybody that's watching, if you don't know us already, Mary Gray is a very talented writer who uh, writ has written her debut novel, The Rental Diaries. So I actually have it over here for anybody that hasn't seen it in person. I feel very lucky because I got an autographed copy in person. <laughs> so it's Tony Johnny. So it's Santa Tony Johnny. So um, I feel very privileged. Um, but maybe just to like kick this off, Mary, what about if you just kind of explain a little bit about yourself and how this came to be? Sure, absolutely. Okay, so um, Rental Diaries, uh, which I have here myself as well, naturally. Um, it's actually a, <laughs> it's actually, um, it's a compilation of uh, 30 columns that I wrote during my tenure as um, events and associate editor of the Florentine, which is a position that I held for about six years. Um, and uh, we launched it, well, so the column was launched in 2017 um, after basically I had been looking for uh, a modest one bedroom to rent in downtown Florence or let's say the, the center of Florence. Um, modest one bedrooms in the center of Florence tend to be <laughs> they're very hard to come by if you actually yes. live um, in the city, live and work. and um, and so um, that was something, it was, a, it was a really challenging thing, uh, finding something affordable and uh, reasonably livable. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I launched a column. There's my dog. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yes, he made an appearance. Okay, Miro is present, everybody. He's we have Miro. Um, so I launched the column to sort of, the, the idea was to celebrate the highs and lows of the search itself um, because I went through a lot of ridiculous experiences and um, strange and lots of strange things happened in the in the hunt for um, for a house. But um, and looking alone as a woman and as a foreigner um, was kind of, you know, an interesting experience in and of itself. Um, but then the column evolved into being more of just a riff on uh the kind of, as I put it in uh, the book description, the joy and despair of um, building a home when you aren't really sure exactly what or where home really is. And so, yeah, it was inspired by, um, by that search, but it doesn't focus just on the search itself. It focuses on little, it's about, it's a collection of little vignettes from my renting life in Florence. And yeah. It, it, I have to say, um, <laughs> One of my favorite excerpts from the from one of your columns was about toilet seats. Uh, <laughs> and as you guys know, I love talking about <laughs> bathrooms, public toilets, because I used to live in front of the uh, one of the Florentine public bathrooms, and I was very proud of that, uh, of course, because <laughs> all kinds of interesting things there. I know that, I know that public bathroom well. <laughs> you know that public bathroom well, and actually, it's kind of hidden too. There's no signs that actually tell you there's a public bathroom. And, FYI, Florence. But um, one of the, the the story that I'm talking about, I'm, I'm actually going to read because there was an excerpt that I that I just love, and, and I think you guys would enjoy it too. Um, 
So you had written, there wasn't a time in nearly three years when the toilet seat wasn't a little loose and otherwise compromised. <laughs> and then you went on further to compare toilet seats to French cheeses and there was like a whole society feel of that and how you can't control the masses. But it's it, it made me laugh this phrase specifically because I lived for you know, seven years in the apartment that I just vacated and the toilet seat was always loose. And we tried to replace it. But as you said, there's a million <laughs> different toilet seats uh, in Italy and that's a, a feat worthy of a professional. <laughs> yes. you, need, you need professionals to intervene usually with this sort of thing. And I think in that, that column specifically, um, I wrote about how, um, that was uh, that toilet seat in my current apartment, actually. Um, I've lived in my current place for three years now, I should specify. I've been in Florence for nearly seven years, which is crazy, but I've been in this, I've been solo living for um, for three years now. Um, and that that toilet seat has been <laughs> the entire time. And um, yeah, and, and in, the, in the column I compared it, I, I said it was the running gag of my rental life. And I said that most people in their rental lives, wherever you are in the world, whether it's Florence or San Francisco or anywhere else, I feel like most people renting have some kind of uh, some kind of running gag in their rental life. And I compared it to um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the uh, with the TV show Modern Family, um, Phil Dunphy, the kind of dopey dad in the series. Um, every time that he runs up the stairs um, in his house he he kind of like trips over or starts to trip over this one step and and always says like gotta fix that step and yeah and it's like a running gag on the show and so i said well this toilet seat is just like the running gag of my rental life just something that i have to deal with <laughs> yeah. i mean it's it's part of life as you said um but maybe before we go into what i was going to ask you next there's a okay. question that jumped up on here uh, from emily majeski she she wrote once you find a place what do they require you to pay up front? Do you pay a whole year up front or a couple of months like in the States? <laughs> oh God. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that mm -hmm. most average people in um, in Italy, as, average as in, you know, not millionaires, uh, <laughs> couldn't manage paying an entire year up front. Um, generally speaking, if you go through an agency, which you usually have to do um, uh, by no choice of your own, but just in terms of what's what's out there, what's listed online, you usually have to pay an agency fee, and then the security uh, security deposit is usually um, two months, um, and then the first month rent. And or wait, actually, I might have paid. Come to think of it, I might have paid just one month security deposit. And, right. Um, Sometimes, but the, I think I think yeah. that's the key there too. Unlike. What I'm experienced here in Switzerland, which is a minimum, I think, three month deposit, subito, which is kind of a, uh, 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 you know, you're like, oh my God, three months, okay. But in Florence, I've always found that it's been very different. Sometimes people ask for a couple of months, sometimes they ask for one month. If you really know the landlord, they might not even ask for even that. It, yeah. It's kind of very, you know, just like a lot of things in Italy are flexible, thus is also that situation. It all depends on like which contract you have too, the, if you have the proper four by four, or three by two, so. Um, but just to kind of go into what we were talking about before, Mary, uh, you know, one of the things that I really loved about this compilation was the fact that you, you know, you and I, we have so much in common, we can chatter for <laughs> hours, which we've done on many an occasion, uh, with a glass or two or three of wine. Um, <laughs> and I think it's because we've lived just like a lot of people we know in Florence, very similar experiences. You know, we coming here in your twenties, not necessarily coming straight away, you know, with a husband and a family and, and not no longer being a student. So we're in this kind of gray area of, you know, not coming here with this massive amount of funds to, you know, do an under, under the Tuscan sun type villa restoration, but really just, you know, being part of the struggle that so many other people and, and immigrants have done uh, when they've come to Florence. So, so, you know, one thing that's really reflected in this compilation is just the fact that you're coming of age in in these stories. Like you, you know, you're going from 20 to 30 and sharing all of these things that could be anywhere. Uh, yeah. So what was it like, you know, having Florence as a setting and, and your thoughts on that? Yeah. 
Um, well, I will share that at the beginning, when I first started writing this column, I mean, obviously it was a column that was published um, in the Florentine. And so we have that audience that, you know, wants to hear about life in Florence and, um, and whatnot. Um, but I didn't want the setting to be way too um, essential to everything. I think that um, a lot of these stories almost could have happened anywhere. I mean, there are some elements that are very distinctly uh, Italian or Florentine, um, certainly, but um, a lot of it, uh, one thing that I've had to kind of uh, grapple with in my years in Italy, when I've, both when I've been um, overjoyed about something and when I've been really stressed about something, um, it's been difficult to parse out a lot of the time, okay, how much of this, um, this challenge or this joy is directly related to the fact that I'm in Italy and how much of it is just a part of life and growing up. Because I came here immediately after I finished um, college or university in the US. And um, I don't have a lot of adult life experience in the US to, com to compare this to. So, um, so yeah, um, I hadn't, and I hadn't really seen my experience reflected very much in a lot of the you know, uh, American woman in Italy kind of narratives that are out there. Um, right. I saw what it kind of seemed like there were two, um, two sort of distinct genres of, uh, of Italy, um, uh, not even necessarily Italy literature, but, um, but just um, ways of portraying the Italian, the experience for um, an American woman in Italy. And it was often, either something kind of, you know, about how, oh, Italy saved my life and turned turned me around. And, you know, I take, I, there's a line in the excerpt of the, in, or in the intro to the book where I say, um, corporate hustlers who um, come to Italy and suddenly hear Duomo bells and taste food for the first time. And that's, <laughs> that's, it's a fun thing to read. It's a fun genre. Um, but, but then it changes when they have to, you know, really get an like internet my, <laughs> my experience, and then the, and then another subset that I saw was um, sort of this, you know, this. Uh, I don't want to say Italy bashing, but kind of, or you know, and 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 I felt like you know, so many of us that are here actually live somewhere in the middle. Um, you know, we just have these imperfect regular life experiences that happen to be in a beautiful place uh, in this, you know, magical city of Florence. But, um, you know, I, it felt like there wasn't, it felt like there were a lot of, there was a lot of gray area that hadn't been addressed. So that was, yeah, that's been, that's, that's okay. part of the spirit of the column, I think, and something that you'll find in the book. And is there is there any particular story in the book that you think um, would really resonate with people who haven't bought in the book yet? <laughs> Not all the book yet. Let's see. Um, so for people outside Italy, um, let's see. There's well, one of my one of my most favorite uh, editions actually is probably the one. Um, volume 30, actually, that, which is the last one in this collection um, that I wrote kind of toward the end of our very intense lockdown here in Italy. And um, I don't know, just with all the different emotions of COVID-19 kind of converging at once. Yeah. And um, I don't know, that was one of the ones that I was, that I'm proudest of. And uh, Let's see what else. He agrees. I, I think Miro's all for it. He's like, you know what? I was with you during the lockdown. Um, and also, that could be something we could also address too is lockdown and renting and I'll give you your home after that because that's that's a it's a deep dark hole of, of uh, <laughs> questions and, and whatnot. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And another another thing, sorry, I'm leaning forward to pick him up. Real life, y'all. Um, um, another, thing that I think, another thing that I think resonates will resonate with people um, who maybe haven't lived in, in Florence, but I've had similar experiences elsewhere, 
just or have ever ventured out on their own and tried to build a life in a new city or a place where they didn't grow up um, is one called Concessions about sort of this idea of what you have to, like everybody always has to make some kind of compromise when looking for a home um, and, you know, exactly what that is, what you're willing to kind of um, not necessarily give up, but let's say forego um, is, is personal. And um, I said, and I, one thing that I decided was I did get a little bit spoiled. I have to admit in my first um, proper apartment with roommates here in Florence, um, or no, not my first one, my second one. Uh, here in the Florida. one with the revolving door of yeah, room, like the revolving door, with the big, uh, the, re the revolving door of roommates. Um, one thing that I, I was extremely lucky there, and that we had a really nice um, terrace. And after that, I was like moving out of my own, and I said, okay, the one thing that I really don't want to compromise on is I want to have some kind of little outdoor space, even if it's literally just a balcony you know, where I can hang a single herb pot or even what we call those, a Juliet balcony, like where you just yeah. literally open up and stick your head outside. I was like, I need that because sometimes in Florence, you just need to look at a leaf and I would yeah. happily have that and then be in a tiny cramped studio apartment, um, which is how most of us who aren't um, Diane Lane <laughs> live here in Tuscany most of the time, so yeah. <laughs> I can relate to that. I have lived in some interesting places. Um, a couple, I remember one apartment in uh, on Via Luna in Piazza Vecaria that I was so excited because it's like, oh my gosh, Piazza Vecaria, it's a great area, it's perfect. And, and imagine, you know, you get so excited about the listing and then you walk up to the place and you realize like why <laughs> there wasn't, wasn't a lot of competition because, you know, you're going down this alleyway and there's no natural light and, uh, you know, the your your roommate is leaves you passive aggressive notes about I don't know cleaning the bathroom or something, and yeah. <laughs> we've all been there. Yeah, I had well actually I love um, that made me think of this one um, this one edition or one um, volume of the column in the book um, called uh, Tutto Incluso or oh, so you that because I actually wrote that down because I was okay. like if you had a question about it go for it but I don't I know. Think just, just more so because I, I, it brings me back to the whole like cultural I mean and this can like once again it can happen everywhere I remember when I moved from Texas to Los Angeles and there were surprises and things about, with the apartment that I didn't expect and the Tutto Incluso was a really good example of just how, you know, something that you think is obvious is not because it's, yeah. it's <laughs> so if you want to explain that or even read from it. Sure. I'm happy to, I'm happy to explain the concept and then maybe read, read that edition. Is that okay? Yes, yeah, cool. please do. I mean, I think people, let's get people excited to read the, the other 29. Yeah. So Tutto Incluso, um, Tutto Incluso, for those who don't speak Italian, means all inclusive or all included. And you often see it attached to apartment ads here. Um, after the price, it'll say something like, say, 600 euros. Oh, well, maybe not 600 euros. That's not, <laughs> we never find apartments for that cheap. If it's 600 euros, there's something um, really, really wrong. <laughs> it'll say, yeah, if you see 600 euro tutto incluso, then th that's a scam. But um, exactly. I mean, it says 800 euro tutto incluso, and that means, um, it means theoretically that all of the bills are included but the lesson that i learned is that you really have to when you're visiting an apartment specify like get real clarity from the um from the owner or the agent or the agency representative um real estate agent excuse me um about uh what is actually included in that tutto incluso umbrella and so yeah i'll read it this is volume 11 um okay volume 11 of the rental diary <laughs> on where yes. to buy here in the show notes. Sure. So, um, tutto incluso, all inclusive. What a difference these two words make in a housing listing. Having the cost of water, gas, electricity, and in certain other worldly apartments, Wi-Fi, factored into a flat monthly rate is usually a rich landlord rude. Still, it's one many of us could happily tolerate. Costs as a tenant in a tutto incluso system can be higher, but it's a small trade-off for the ease of no post office legwork, 
no meter reading, no calls from utility companies. Knowing precisely what's in your pocket each month, priceless. But in Florence, we run into a real estate variation on one infamous Orwell theme. All to two inclusive rents include everything, but some include more everything than others. I'm reminded of a friend who was blue by a listing for a friend's department with Tutto Incluso tacked on at the end. Upon visiting, she discovered Tutto Incluso just meant that the pictured furniture was part of the deal. Never trust an ad with no bullet points of bills under the Tutto umbrella. Oh! Miro agrees. He yeah, agrees. I was going to say, that was an affirmation from Miro. The very existence of Tutto Incluso setups can also cause confusion for negligent landlords. My takeover tenant, and that's the reference to Rental Diaries Volume 8, is in a space where nothing is incluso, yet all utilities remain in the owner's name. She assumed it was a convenience-based decision on his part. Cluelessness is the more probable explanation. By all appearances, he seems to think they set a tutto incluso rate, though the flat space rent remains fixed as it ever was. Someone, we're not sure who, has been paying the takeover tenants' bills over the past year and a half, since no power outages nor heating halts have transpired. All signs point to bad math or a property manager gone rogue, but I guess we'll never really know who's still. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I will have you know, that Mary, that was so well written, by the way. I I, I even read it to Nico, and he was like, Mary's brilliant. Oh, um, thank you. I, like yeah, your I had a tuto incluso moment um, because we reached, we recently purchased a, a home in Florence and we had exactly that situation where I was under the impression that the things that we had talked about were tuto incluso and, and it wasn't the case. So <laughs> it was a failure of the agency and whatever. But it, it was, I mean, even after so many years of being fairly confident in Italian and uh, thinking you kind of, you know, you know all the ins and outs, you can still be surprised by <laughs> these little things. Absolutely. Well, how do you think it compares? How has your experience compared um, in Switzerland so far to kind of the experience of, well, I don't want to say the experience of renting in Florence, but I know you you just recently purchased a home in Florence. Mm -hmm. How do you think that um, purchasing a home in Florence and renting a home in Zoob might um, impact your approach to both cities? Good question. Thank you for that. I uh, just threw one right at me there. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Honestly, it's been, it's been kind of, it's been interesting. I would say that obviously the stereotype of things in Switzerland being quite efficient and, and straightforward is true. Uh, everything is really uh, not only black and white, but written in extremely difficult German. So uh, the one language that I have absolutely no knowledge of at all, except for Prost, which is cheers in German. But uh, I would say that you know, I'm used to the way things work in Italy more than I'm used to anything else. So it's always surprising to me when I actually have to adhere to uh, certain strict rules, like you have to pay a rent on the first direct time. It's always been like a little bit more flexible, uh, you know, and I think I've been lucky with that, even if I'm kind of a rule follower by nature. Um, but what I've experienced so far here is just everything is what it, says nothing less nothing more uh the the rules are, are clear and even though that can be hard because you know it can be very expensive switzerland is much more expensive than italy of course especially in the area we're in but it's been i think i'm just so used to the way things are in italy that anything else i'm just like um, i'm kind of like a little kid i'm like oh my god it was so easy wow <laughs> You know, so I, 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 it's exciting and I'm honestly ready for that kind of efficiency because, you know, obviously trying to find a new house during the lockdown, not being able to see the apartment we were going to live in was very, very stressful. Uh, and then, of course, the purchasing of the house and everything like that. So basically, we just need to drink a lot. Um, <laughs> and Helen asked about the recycling because I'm sharing on social media about the recycling in Switzerland because it's very intense in a good way in a very good way, but I've never been more intimidated by throwing anything away in my life. <laughs> I feel like the trash police are gonna come at any moment and find me for accidentally not putting you know, the glass in the right container. But honestly, I've, I, I've learned, thankfully, all the fumblings of life in Italy 
are, you know, they've taught me how to kind of adapt in any place, I guess. So, uh, yeah, it's a culture shock. It's like, could not be the more opposite place, of course. But people generally forgive you when you kind of look like a lost puppy and you're like, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know? yeah. I'm using that to our advantage a little bit here. Uh, but I have, I mean, I've been fairly lucky with renting in Florence too. I was very good friends with my landlord, but I've also compromised on so many different things, like living in an absolute, you know, especially right now during the summer, extremely hot third floor walk up because it has great views. Because as you said, you know, life is all about compromise. So, uh, you know, for me working from home, it was always so tantamount to having natural light and feeling like I was in the city because, you know, uh, and somebody asked this too, actually, I was reading on the comments question that somebody asked about like which neighborhoods for like an authentic feel. Now what's um, interesting is, you know, authentic depends on who you talk to because at the end of the day, now that there's no, you know, almost no tourism, uh, you can really see the, the ins and outs of the city's daily life for the people that aren't on vacation or are not at the beach. Um, so I would say, you know, of course I'm very, very personally tied to the old Darno and Mary lives there too. And, and we're actually going to be closer neighbors when I go back to Florence. So uh, but I would say there's so many, I mean, Florence is such a human sized city. Everything is walkable, you know? So whether you're in Piazza Beccaria or La Cure or even Isolotto or Piazza San Giacopino, you, you really, if you're open-minded, you'll you'll see all the joy there is into those micro communities, you know, even more so some, that than maybe living directly in the center. Like if you really want to learn Italian, maybe live over there first and then come yeah. into the center, yeah. center, center. I don't know what you think, Mary. Yeah, I would say that if you, I mean, I don't, I don't really love the um, word authentic because I think that people it's a little bit overused. Yeah, <laughs> from what your view of that is, and um, I feel like authentic has now become its own sort of marketing word. Yeah, but, um, but I do think like um, organic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I do think. I mean, in, in down, downtown Florence really is, I mean, the, the, we're talking about the historic center. Um, I mean, if you want, if, if by authentic, what you mean is you want proper linguistic immersion and you want to um, live mostly around Florentines. Um, well, prior to the pandemic, now things might change a little bit in the new, um, kind of the new landscape that will emerge. But um, Prior to the pandemic, I would say go live in Campo di Marte or in uh, Novoli. Well, Novoli it has a lot of international students as well, but not necessarily like English speaking. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it depends on, I mean, charm, charm is a big part of the historic center of Florence, but authenticity, if we're talking about like real actual, where you're not going to hear English being spoken, then you need to get further out, farther out. Yeah, so so basically what she was saying was getting away from the tourist trap. So yeah, I mean, I agree with Mary. If you, if you know, Gavinana, Le Cure, San Jacopino, Isolotto, uh, Via Pisana, these are all areas where they're close to the center in Iscandici and easy to get there via tram, the tram or the bus and uh, you, you know, it, you can really live in, and see local residents on, on a grander scale because that was a sad thing. I mean, I lived in the historical center for eight years uh, and then another eight years outside the center. And during the lockdown, like you just, I mean, there was so many, you know, windows shuttered. You know, I realized how many people don't live in the center and yeah. everybody talked about that. Now the mayor's going on this campaign about wanting to bring people there. So, uh, you know, you have to keep an open mind about what is, once again, authentic and, and, and real and what you're comfortable with. So if you could come here and spend more time or do some sets of research online, um, you'll find something that works for you or at least get something temporary when you're first here and then find your longer term accommodation, you know, while you're here on the ground, if you, if you can, if you have the time and the means. So, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I didn't mean to, I didn't want to say earlier that you can't possibly have a good and authentic experience living in the center of Florence. I mean, I live in the center of Florence basically out of necessity in that 
I mean, I, I don't live like in Casa Duomo. <laughs> I live on kind of the um, southwest, yeah, southwest edge of the historic center. Um, and uh, and I think that you can have, I mean, it's a really nice place to live and I wanted to live here for many different reasons. Um, but I, but I just meant, you know, if what you're, if what you're looking for is like intense linguistic immersion, then, um, you know, and, and being away from tourists entirely, then you'll need to go <laughs> to residential areas because, but in the sense of like daily life in Florence, it's not a bad deal to be in the, in, in the center. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to go wrong. I mean, at the end of the day, you'll, you'll probably be fine either way. And I will say that, uh, you know, here in Florence in any capacity, it's, it's, it's awesome in that way. So, um, Mary, I have to ask, cause I feel like people would enjoy this. You know, people yeah. are all thinking about the rental diaries theme and everything like that. Um, well, we have to talk about some stories of places we've seen are just, you know, awkward yeah. renting situations because <laughs> I feel like the beauty of this theme is that Anyone can relate probably in any city, to be honest, but yeah. you know, uh, not everyone has had the joy of uh, walking in and seeing all the possibilities that there are in our, you know, the Renaissance city. Yeah. So um, what are some things, quirky things or interesting things that you have found when you were looking for apartments that people might not expect? Okay, well, um, I will begin one one of these is featured in one of the columns. It's actually volume one of the um, of the series. Um, is uh, one thing that kept popping up a lot when I was looking for a one bedroom after having lived in that revolving door house for years, um, <laughs> uh, which I loved. I don't don't get me wrong. I left because I was just ready to try living on my own. Um, one theme that I kept seeing popping up. This was in 2017, and I've heard that it's gotten better since then. Um, was there were tons of people who were renovating um, old like artisan bottega or like artisan workshops and studios um, or ground floor stores, basically commercial spaces, and turning them into apartments and then putting this weird kind of like opaque coating on the glass doors. Yeah. And yeah. Apartments. And this is <laughs> not exactly legal. Actually, it's entirely illegal, yeah. and um, but you might not know that. If, I mean, I, I discovered this by you know talking to networks of people and realizing something is fishy about this. Um, and I found it strange that I saw several apartments where it was like the the people, the owners had gone to all the trouble of like renovating an old store or an old workshop, and really not bothering to make it comply with actual um regulations and the risk is i mean if you and so the very first like volume one of the rental diaries is when someone tried to get me to sign a six by six contract which is the type of contract given for commercial space I was gonna say, I was six by six contract. <laughs> so that and and that's like grounds for eviction if the police ever show up so i mean yeah, yeah i didn't do that obviously but i mean but like people might not necessarily know that you shouldn't do that, you know? And anyway, or maybe I'm just a goody two shoes, but in any case, I didn't want to want to take want to take that risk, take that risk for a while. And then um I'll yeah, well another and then I'll keep this short, but actually when I was in Rome, because I lived in Rome for a year prior to coming uh to Florence, um I, I had a uh I went on an interview for an au pairing position like a live-in au pair position. Uh, and it turned out to be uh, a gentleman of a certain age who didn't have any children or grandchildren to speak of, um, but wanted a live-in au pair for like the his nieces that occasionally came over like once a month. And that was, <laughs> that, was <laughs> that was something, obviously I didn't. I you didn't, didn't want to take him up on that. Oh, it sounds appealing. Up on that offer, but um, yeah, tell me some of the crazy things that you've seen. Oh my gosh! So I've also had many funny stories when it comes to looking for the perfect rental. Uh, I remember, you know, when I was moving from the outside of the center into the center, I was in a 
I just didn't have a lot of money at the time and I didn't have at least enough to even live on my own. So I needed to, to have roommates and uh, which is hard, you know, I was in my, let's say later twenties. And I, I was kind of like, I, th I thought of it as a little bit of a failure, even though obviously it wasn't a lot of people had to have roommates, but I was just like, Oh my gosh, I'm going from, you know, being in my own home to that. And uh, I was checking out apartments and it, and it was just like everything I had. It, and it was a time that was like the worst time to look for apartments. It was, you know, summer and, oh, hot hot and people were on vacation. So it was kind of like, you know, I would walk into this room and it would be like three single beds, three Italian students who are like, wanted to assess if I would fit into staying in the same room, which of course in my mind already, I was like, no, 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 no. It's like, no, not gonna work. Like I need a, a minimum of privacy and, you know, having to kind of go through the, uh, the motions of pretending like I wanted to see the place and also feeling guilty because I didn't want to waste their time. And that's exactly what was happening. Uh, but what was really funny was when, uh, so I had a situation with the whole commercial space thing too. This is the thing guys, you know, people are trying to rent these commercial spaces. So uh, I was, I answered an ad on one of the, you know, Americans know Craigslist and which exists in Italy. I don't know anymore, um, but uh, I use the Italian version of like KGG or Bacheca and they have all the kind of listings and apartments. And I answered one that was kind of like romantic, perfect for one person. And it was in my budget. So I was so excited about it. Cause I was like, okay, perfect. It's near Piazza Libertà. And so I, uh, I talked, I called the lady on the phone and we started talking about it. And she's like, uh, just a couple of things that I should let you know before you come see it. And I was like, okay, yeah, let me know. She's like, so the one thing is, is um, it's you know so romantic, it's perfect, it's you're gonna love it. I bet you're gonna want it immediately, which is already a bad sign. Like normally, people aren't that enthusiastic about you taking the place, especially during that time when there was, like I said, so much competition. Uh, mm -hmm. And then she starts to explain that for some reason, um, she was kind of asking me what I did for work to make sure that I had a job, which isn't uncommon, of course. But she was like, you know, you can't come between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m during the week, Monday through Friday, like you have to be out. And I was like, wait, what? And then the next part of it was, oh, uh, there's no kitchen, but there is like a, you know, like a plug in hot pot, but that's okay because you're American and you don't like cook anyway, I'm sure. I love it. <laughs> so already I'm offended because I'm like, look lady, you don't know, like, you know, if I love to cook or not. Uh, but then I just, it kind of like clicked in my mind that like, the lady's trying to rent me an office space. <laughs> I couldn't go there from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. because it's a romantic boy. Uh, you know, between nine, because people were working there. So um, I, that was, I was impressed by that like ballsy attempt at least. So I was like, wow. Yeah. That takes me so <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, it, uh, so somebody asked here too, uh, before I start rambling on, uh, about like any weird or interesting stories about neighbors? Neighbors, oh, um, absolutely, yeah, oh gosh. <laughs> well, um, so I mentioned that the column kind of was, like came out of um, the, the search for a one bedroom, but actually a lot of what I write about, a lot of the anecdotes um, mentioned in the book, um, happened in uh, this four bedroom apartment that I lived in on Via Romana um, for nearly four years um, with a, a revolving door of roommates. Um, and I was like the one constant, sort of the anchor person in the house. And um, there were, and a woman who figures in heavily to um, a lot of those stories is Elena, who I called the guardian of the ground floor. We were on the, <laughs> We were on the third floor, um, which would be, I guess, the fourth floor in American terms. Um, but yeah, third floor walk up, and um, yeah, she was uh, she was feisty, and um, I I mentioned in one of the columns that she uh, paid no rent and took no prisoners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to explain the no rent part. She paid no rent. Yeah, no, I think that she was like someone's relative. Like I think, okay, or okay. She, was, she was, she was, I mean, quite elderly and um, lived on her own. And I think that um, she was uh, like a relative of maybe someone, not the owner, but someone dear to the owner because um, she talked too disparagingly about the owner to be related to him. 
but, <laughs> but and the guy owns the whole palazzo. But um, in any case, Elena uh, would often, like basically anytime that there was a power outage in our apartment on the fourth floor, um, or anytime like we blew a fuse or something, which often happened because we were four girls and like turning on hair dryers or something, you know, we, our apartment couldn't handle more than one hair dryer at once. Mm -hmm. And um, that would always cause her TV to putter out. And then she would like r run into the hall and like yell operatically about like, you know, my TV's out, like, what have you done? Like, get down here. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, I mean, that's that, that, and that's one of the columns too called um, Fuse Boxes and Forgiveness. I think it's volume three. And we, uh, uh, w when we had one particularly um, heated run in with her in the, in the hallway. And then there was another story, another story of, na of neighbors. I mean, I actually have a lot of really touching stories about my neighbors, um, namely being, I mean, y'all heard my dog misbehaving earlier. He's usually pretty decent, um, but uh, he was getting excited seeing me like talk. But the dog, um, basically like, so my current building, um, I have, I think there's wait, there's eight total apartments in the building and, um, very long story short, um, when I got my dog initially, my, uh, I had, my landlady had given me the okay to get a dog and, um, but then she kind of like changed her mind once the dog was already here and wanted me to give him up. And basically everybody in the building, many of whom I never had really even spoken to, um, like petitioned her to let me keep him. And that was really, I was really touched by that. And that was one of the first times I really felt like, wow, I'm, I'm like at home in Florence, you know, this was, I was really touched by that. And then of course, you know, I've had plenty of, not so touching <laughs> run-ins with the same neighbors. Um, but, and you know, I've had passive aggressive notes left in my, um, <laughs> left in my uh, mailbox and things. But, um, but yeah, and another time, I don't know, I got, one time I got uh, uh, locked out of my apartment when I had um, a friend visiting from the UK and um, we thought we were gonna have to like, climb out of the building and scale the wall down into my little garden and come back in the back door because um, I very intelligently had left it unlocked. But actually it would have worked, it worked out in our favor. But anyway, we thought we were gonna have to scale the wall outside until we realized that um, our neighbor could simply just like walk over into my garden from his garden and, um, and, come, and come in that way and let us in. And so yeah, that's, I don't know. We've had lots of little incidents like that happen with neighbors, and there's yeah. lots of in the book, in the book. Yeah, no. And I, I love it when you talk about your neighbors because I think you know it, it's funny. You uh, and Alexander Corey, um, who is flawed, also writes a lot for the Florentine when she has a moment. But you guys both talk about the perils and joys of living on a ground floor apartment with a garden uh, because things fall from. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, you you guys find magic pet treasures. I remember in in one time with Alex's case, she talks about getting I think porcini mushrooms <laughs> fell from the sky somehow, and then she gave people like a day to to claim the mushrooms, and they didn't, so they ate them. <laughs> So did have you found anything interesting? <laughs> I have found anything interesting. I will say I can't believe that I was asked about neighbors and I didn't come up with the most obvious um <laughs> policy mention, which is volume um uh, uh I think it's volume eight, maybe volume seven, UFOs, unidentified falling objects. And that's the one where I talk about how um, neighborly interactions increased for me a lot once I moved to a ground floor apartment because people are always dropping stuff um, that lands in my garden. Not as much lately, but at the beginning, or maybe I just noticed it less because I've been here longer and I'm more used to it. But at the beginning, it was like happening all the time. And usually it's just people's laundry, nothing exciting. 
I've been um, that person who dropped the laundry, so I understand. Yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, and I've basically like all, I, the thing that's nice is that I never have to buy clothes pins because <laughs> oh, clothes shit. pins are just like fall into my garden and no one is going to come around like knocking, asking, okay, can I have my clothes pin back? Um, Cause people hang their laundry like outside the window. So yeah, I never really have to buy clothes pins. I just like, I hoard all my neighbors, which is maybe bad, but no one has, written me any past that's, that's the social contract one makes you know depending yeah. on what floor you live in you know you you're either the one dropping the things or the one accepting the things um i will say though that during uh the the lockdown in italy you know which was very intense uh compared to many around the world and you know most of us really you're at home you're at home for for a good two months uh i will say that it in a way you notice and are gracious or maybe not so much depending on the situation uh, because of that period, because that's this very unique time. And, and uh, it, when we're all kind of there together, like I know that with my building, so the department I lived in before, uh, which I think is always going to feel like <laughs> my apartment, I'm just going to be staring at it every time I go back to Florence. But um, yeah, my neighbors, I felt like we were, you know, we always knew each other. We didn't know each other that well, but I knew of them and they were all super nice. And most of them were Florentines who had lived there for a long time, which is kind of rare for the, you know, Old Arno Direct Center. I mean, maybe not for the Old Arno, but it, it can be rare to find uh, that, you know, a lot of things have been turned into Airbnb. But I think I was really touched by the fact that like, it, everyone was kinder and more thoughtful and we were kind of had this like we survived this together moment yeah. because it was so tense and dark when you went out in the streets in March and April and uh, there was that feeling like you know I saw a lot of you know what people maybe you've seen this on the news or maybe you haven't but you know a lot of people left notes and offered to bring groceries and medicine and things like that to their elderly neighbors and there was this kind of movement you know, right away, because, you know, there was so there's there was and there is so much at stake, you know, of, of we, you know, we have to get in order to get through this, we need to get through this together. So um, yeah. think neighbors, <laughs> you maybe appreciate them even more now, because they are there, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I had um, one of my upstairs neighbors um, sent me a text message at one point during, uh, during the lockdown. Um, saying, hey, you know, just in case, you know, I know you're on your own. Like, if you need anything, let me know. Um, and I said something to the effect of like, oh, well, you know, I am on my own, but thank goodness that there's like internet to keep up with friends and family, both in Italy and abroad. And somehow she, mis like, she misunderstood that and thought that, <laughs> and she's like, you can use my internet. I'll give you the <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That's not that's not what I meant. Um, but yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it was definitely like this sort of shared shared trauma that we all lived through together. And um, I do feel a bit more bonded to my neighbors now, um, including the ones right above me who blasted Sean Paul for a lot of um, <laughs> for a lot. Of we had, a, we had a neighbor who was who had a sudden passion for ABBA after you know, oh, for, okay. over, you know and, and you know like replaying that song over and over again it was it was awesome and a little bit too much from time to time uh, so Mary I have to like because we have to wind this up oh soon. yeah 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 but not, we can oh, yeah, not quite yet you're warned. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but I have to ask. So you know, this is your first book. Um, yeah. Definitely not your last. At least not to mm -hmm. me, because you're. You know, mm -hmm. Mary is an incredible writer. Everyone, go. Okay. Uh, maybe they can share the link to your articles in general on the on the Florentine. But you're you're so talented. You you weave your words like, you know, poetry. And I always enjoy reading what you write. Um, so now that you've done this and you've kind of, you know, debut novel here, what's next for you? Like what, what's in the plans? Are you going to change apartments? Are you going to write another book? Uh, what are you thinking? Oh, right now. Yeah. I've got, oh, good question. What's everyone's plan right now? Um, <laughs> no well, plan is also okay I'll too, by the way. No I shame. Do hope, I do hope that, um, I actually have gotten, this book has helped me kind of get back into the swing of um, get motivated to get back into kind of doing more writing again, because although I, I am a writer, but 
<laughs> obviously, but in the past, let's say, I don't know, from January to May, so kind of while COVID was at its height, another thing here, um, I had started teaching writing to US study abroad students here in Florence. And my focus was primarily on teaching other people how to write for like five or six months, even once they returned to the US because of the pandemic. Um, I was doing a lot of online teaching. Um, so in writing and in media studies. And uh, so that was where my concentration was for a while. So what I'm hoping to do now is focus more on building up um, more of my freelance journalism portfolio um, on Italy, but not just on Italy, um, on different uh, cultural topics. And um, I think I'm kind of a, I'm a features writer and an essayist at heart. So I don't think that you'll find me um, uh, writing tons of news from the front lines of, uh, of the pandemic. But, um, but yeah, look out for, for new bylines in new and exciting spaces. And um, yes, I do. I think I have at least one other book in me. Um, and I'm playing with a bunch of different ideas at the moment. Um, I always have some different projects marinating, but it probably, we probably won't see that come to fruition <laughs> for a little while. Um, so yeah, what I'm, what I'm trying to use this summer to do is kind of get back on the pitching horse and get back into um, focusing on my own writing rather than um, teaching others, although I do really enjoy that as well. I think both go so well together, you know, I feel like if you're able to teach somebody, you're, you, you know, one thing that's wonderful about working with students and, and talking to them about the process of writing and putting, you know, pen to paper is you find out, you learn, you end up learning so much from them too. Like the few times I've been lucky enough to, you know, be a guest lecturer, I've, I've often been so, I've walked away from the experience probably getting more than they did. Uh, yeah. Also because you kind of, you know, if you're working from home, especially you get into your little bubble and you don't always get that much access to, to people of all different generations and, and places. And we're all such a different periods in our lives as well. So uh, I, I personally, you know, really love and respect the way you write as well, because I do think that, you know, I personally love like long form reads that are very, uh, you know, not even just memoir like, but you know how to tell a story. And so um, I really hope that people, you know, read the book, Rental Diaries. <laughs> also because it really, I mean, me that I've loved your, I think whether you've never visited Florence, love Florence, come every year. It's, it's a book that speaks to everybody because we've all lived within four walls. So, <laughs> you know, what, regardless of, if it's, you know, Dan Lane's villa or if it's a tiny buco in Via de la Luna, uh, <laughs> <laughs> We've been there. Some people can relate to it, and I just I think it's so great. I'm happy you you guys and the Florentine did this together, and that we had the chance to talk about it today. Um, it makes me feel more connected because, for me, you know, I'm never I'm never gonna get rid of never gonna get rid of Florence over here. <laughs> oh my god, I love that! I love that necklace. Amazing, amazing. And um, yes, I feel like yeah, I. Georgia, you've been so kind in hosting this and guiding the conversation because you know how I tend to ramble. We both ramble. Oh, that's, that's just part of life. <laughs> um, and um, so thank you so much. And I really love um, I really love your work too and your and your blog. And I just always think that I just think you're so um, gregarious and generous of spirit. And it's seen in your it, that comes out in your blog all the time. And I really look forward to seeing what you're going to do with it in um, as you make the transition into life in Switzerland. And I know you'll be back in Florence often with us. And I can't wait to talk more about life within our four walls and beyond them. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be like a sequel, sequel, then something, and then sequel, then something, because, you know, the world has changed so much in, in you know, such a short amount of time. Okay. Who knows what we have waiting for us. So, Mary, thank you so much. And everybody, thank you, thank you guys for listening to us. Um, Wednesday afternoon and wherever you are in the world, it's appreciated. Uh, and hopefully we'll get to talk again soon. So, yes, much love to all. Thank you all for coming. Ciao, everybody. Bye. Ciao a tutti. Bye-bye.